you know, I learned, learned things that, you know, my grandmother used to teach me. And I tell this really simple story when my dad came home from work one time and said, we're going to the Point Erin Pars, you know, in, in town. And then we're all getting our togs and towels ready. And then my grandmother said, no, not going to the pools. My dad said, come on, mum, we've got to go to the pools. The kids are ready. There's a small pool for the kids, another pool for the adults. You know, there's a cafeteria and all that. And only a Polynesian woman can say this. <laughs> she said, if God wants us to go to the swimming pool, he would have born us in the swimming pool. He born us in the sea. <laughs> So guess what? We went to the beach. <laughs> so, but you know, when I was in there, I was thinking, like, okay. But when you grow up, right, you think about these crazy, funny moments, right? And I thought to myself, what was my grandmother on? And I realized, you know what? She was reminding me and reminding us that sometimes you can be in a world where everyone wants, wants to put you in a swimming pool. In other words, they want to put you in a box. They want to classify you. You're this. You're that. And you know what she said? We weren't born to be put into little boxes mm. of people's, you know, stigma, you know, and trying to say that because everyone wants to classify you as this and that. She said, no, 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 you weren't born for that. You're born for the ocean. That's cool. And you go to the edge and you turn around and you look at the ocean and it goes, whoa, man, this is massive. You think you're like, you don't, can't see the end of the horizon. You don't know the depth. But, you know, you, she teaches, they say, well, Say a prayer, give thanks, and then go. Do you still have the same zeal in terms of when you first started it with national as opposed to now with new zeal in terms of what's the new zeal now? Like, obviously, you started a national, you know, man of faith, and they, they would have been like, oh, man, I want to do this. I want to help my, my people, help the nation, and so forth. But in terms of the new zeal, what's the zeal now? What's the zealous um, with you now? Is it something that's totally... Um, brand new or was it just the, the same values and the same unction that you had from, from the beginning when you were a national? Yeah, um, one of the things I suppose, I mean, I'm, I'm thankful. I mean, to be honest, my wife's more political than I am. You know, I mean, uh, I didn't... I she didn't should have really, taken the other seat. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I personally didn't have a political bone in my body when I was just like, man, I didn't really care for all the politics around. And I was one of those disengaged and disenfranchised, really. It didn't. It didn't really matter to me. But then I, I realised that actually, when I when I got in there, I started thinking like, okay, this is a really interesting system, and the system has the power to impact people's lives and impact our community, and I, I began to understand that. And I'm thinking like, wow. And then when I went in there, like when I became the Minister of Pacific Peoples, the first place I went is the MB, the Ministry of Business, uh, Economic and Innovation, and I said to them. Tell me what our people look like through that window. And, you know, it's interesting what we look like because they had an economic development planned and it was based on immigration, housing and income. And I thought, well, wow, is that it? Is that who we are? And I think, man, surely we're bigger and better than that. But that was it. And then I realised that, OK, then things need to shift. Under EMB, for instance, the driving uh, force of our economy is actually 550,000 SMEs, small to medium enterprises. We made, made up 1.4%. And like, like, we don't even feature in here in a way that we should. Mm. So I thought, no, nah, that's got to change. We've got to shift that system, not just for us, but for all people. And I suppose that for me, then I began to understand that actually things need to move and things have changed. And, you know, I got a chance to be able to do some of that. So anyway, came in, went that. So I, I, I'm thankful, but I realised that actually if I really want to get in there and actually really shift the dial, then we've got to have something that is us. You know, it's like running your own business, right? You can work for something, but for someone, but the day you work for yourself, it's a whole new world. Now you get to determine the scope, the opportunities. You get to drive the set of values that actually... You know, drive that, and I, I suppose you know that's what I you know to answer your question. Now there's a, a different zeal, right? Because now it's a me zeal. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it's all of me, not half of me, yeah. or not part of me. That sort of, you know, because I got to run a certain line a certain way that the system runs. Like working for a company, right? And the company's got a set of guidelines, and you learn a lot. I just love this opportunity and really grateful because now actually we can make it work. I can make it work in a way that I know 
works best mm. and the fullness not the halfness of who I am previously can be here and look this is this is not just a you know just a, a one night wonder and think see how we go and you know um, that's it this is a legacy for the future that's what I believe and so now New Zeal actually is a legacy so that I'm just going to be here like I was when I was the first call to get in um, that's what we're meant to be about break the glass ceilings, create the pathway forward. And then once we've done that, then that's the pathway for others to do the same thing too. And that's what I really believe is that what we are doing is creating a pathway saying we can. When others say we can't, that's what makes us even even more stronger. Especially when they start mocking you and thinking, oh, who are you? You're too small. You do that. You're not, you're not this and that. I say bring it on. Mm. That's who we are. You know, look at Fiji. Woohoo! Yeah, yeah, Fiji. <laughs> Come on, yeah, this one. Come yeah. on, you know, and that's that's what I love about that. That's who we are. And when people doubt us, that's when the best of us comes out. And so I just really believe that this is a legacy for the future, in regards to politics that we've never had before. And then we are here. That we might be Polynesian, but guess what? We're Kiwis. We're New Zealanders. We can serve all people. And we can not be the people who add on to a system, but we can be part of helping to lead the system, you know, in a sense of governance in our nation. So, yeah, it's uh, this is the new zeal. This is the new energy that's got us and got me very excited about um, what the future could look like. Mm -hmm. It's almost a paradox, so, eh, the name, like new zeal, because you come with so much experience. <laughs> you know, you're not just like a new dude who's just rocked up. Um, and mm -hmm. has just taken this leadership role. You come with so much experience and what a wonderful opportunity it is to be able to present the zeal that you probably had within yourself to lead the country um, and to marry that together. I think it's it's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's really it cool. Because yeah, I can imagine, um, Alfred, you know, like you said earlier, um, people who come in and think they can run a campaign, and, oh, I'm going to be the new leader, and whatever happens, and get all these seats... But you've been in the game. You've been in the. You've you've been. You've you put skin in the, in the mm. game as well. So you've been there for, for nine years as a cabinet minister, and so you know what it takes. And I think people, I don't know. I shouldn't say this, but, but some people might think, oh, it might be disillusioned to say, oh, no, I can do a better job. And you've heard other people, other party leaders say, oh, things that man, it's unrealistic. And so in terms of talking about unrealistic, people might be might be assuming, um, Alfred. You probably left the campaign for a bit, bit too long in terms of the runway. What do you, what do you say to that? What do you think? Because I know you're like, you're, you're like, man, optimistic, I can do this. So the, um, you know, we call it the elephant in the room, right? And I said, oh, come on, you know, too big, too small, too late. Um, but the real elephant in the room is actually not time or size. It's actually unbelief. And so what I hear from people is this. They say, oh, look, as far as politics is concerned, well, we don't like those people. Uh, we used to like these people, but we're not sure. No, we don't like those people. But we'll choose them because it's the lesser of two evils. And, um, you know, surely we can do better than that. And all that is, to be honest, is voting out of fear, not mm. voting out of hope. So, the, so I would say to people, so if you could vote out of hope, what would hope look like to you? What would, a, a leader, what would leadership look like that reflects hope? What would a party that reflects hope now we're talking about a different game now. Now rather than actually just settling for that, we can actually settle for something better. And as far as time is concerned, you know, um, in 2002, for instance, there was Peter Dunn, who was a one-man part of United Future. You know, it only took a moment where he was able to speak truth. He went from less than two months, a one-man party to a 10-person party. So there's a precedent where stuff can happen. And so I would say is this, we can't afford to wait uh, for another three years. The time is now. Mm. The The setting is that, like I said, it's been now nearly 12 months and yet still people are undecided. It only takes a moment to people to say, I'm going to vote out of hope. I'm going to vote New Zealand because it reflects the hope that I see as the leadership that we can have. It's the, the vehicle of a party that has a set of values. And as you said, Caroline, I mean, five priorities of, you know, family. Family for us is always the centre for all of our communities, yeah, cool. not just Polynesian communities. And when I say family, because anyone can say that, when I say family at the centre, if you, having been there, it's a policy position 
So those of you who are in policy, we have a thing called the paramountcy clause. In other words, what's at the centre? Now I can tell you, families have been removed, removed in many cases from the centre. And they'll say they'll put the child in there. Everything sounds okay. But when you put the family outside, even of the child, it becomes a surrogate of support. In other words, like health and education and other departments, they're just you know in the same league. Now family is not the centre. And what happens if you follow the line? That means decisions that can be made for the child don't always have to come from the, from the, from the family and the parent. The number of parents who've said to me, I feel like we're starting to lose our voice. That now decisions are being made for our children outside of us. And so that's what happens. When we say we put family in the centre, it's just not a, a nice thing to say. It's a policy position cool. that makes a difference. Everything from finance, for instance, I spent time with the Minister of Finance, uh, Bill English was there, and what I learned is that finance, fiscal responsibility, financial responsibility, is not just about money. In fact, primarily it's about attitude and behaviour. And we've had a lot of bad attitudes and, and irresponsible behaviour and wasteful spending. You see, it's actually called the public purse because the taxes that everyone from our, from the cleaners, you know, to the farmers, to the business owners and so forth, People pay tax. It's called the public purse. So it's not just made up money. It's not. It's the government's responsibility to use what's been handed to them. And people need to be reminded about that. Um, everything from farming, for instance, it just feels like people are using the farmers as the burden of blame around climate and the environment. And now all of a sudden, the, the planet and the environment is more important than the people when they're meant to go hand in hand. So things like that, just starting to shift things, getting things back into alignment, back into order. And as you said, Caroline, it's almost like we created these 50 shades of grey because somehow the grey is going to be helpful. No, it's not. Mm. You got to you get no clarity. All of a sudden, all you get is confusion. Yeah. We've got to get back to some understanding, you know, what's the clarity here? What's the simplicity about we know what's important? And then everything from freedoms to the future – and what I love about this whole thing around future, which is around education, it's this attitude. And I used to argue with people. People said, education's the key. And I said, no, it's not. Education's the key. No, it's not. And I said, what do you mean? So what's the key? I said, attitude. And I can prove it every time. And I said, because education is a tool, very powerful. But if you have attitude along with education, you can change the world. Mandate.